the job to build a pipeline. It wasn't a big project as pipelines go, but it was very significant. It was the first modern pipeline to be built in Canada's north. In 1983, Interprovincial Pipeline Limited began construction of the Norman Wells Pipeline. The pipeline runs 866 kilometers from Norman Wells in the Northwest Territories to Zama, Alberta. There it connects with the existing national network. The Norman Wells oil field has supplied local northern markets since the 1920s. Early in the 1980s, Esso Resources expanded its production here by building six islands in the Mackenzie River and drilling over 150 new wells. A pipeline had to be built to move the increased flow of oil to refineries in southern Canada. The pipeline route follows the Mackenzie River Valley, a remote and sparsely inhabited wilderness region. Here, the people live in scattered settlements, separated by hundreds of miles of spruce, muskeg, and water. Most of the inhabitants are native people, who still depend on hunting and trapping for at least part of their livelihood. Because of the potential impact of this project on the north, lengthy public hearings were held before the pipeline was approved by the federal government. The approval specified the most stringent terms of reference that have ever been imposed on a Canadian pipeline. Construction was an engineering challenge. The pipeline traverses muskeg, intermittent permafrost, numerous slopes and more than 100 streams. It crosses two major rivers, the Great Bear, and the Mackenzie. All the mainline construction had to be done in winter when the ground is hard enough to support heavy machinery. There were other challenges as well. The most challenging aspect of this project was the human one. The human concern for jobs, for business opportunities, and the human concern for the environment. It's those three items which together gave us the greatest challenge. Great care was taken to minimize the environmental impact of the project. A route was selected to avoid sensitive areas such as archaeological sites and nests of birds of prey. Permafrost areas were given special attention. Permafrost, stated very simply, is a soil that stays frozen for greater than 365 days. In the case of the Norman Wells Pipeline, most of the permafrost is much, much older than that, probably in the order of thousands of years. Permafrost can become a problem when the insulating layer of vegetation is removed. Heat from the sun penetrates the soil and begins the thawing process. As ice melts away, the ground may slump and slopes may become unstable, especially in water-rich soils. In areas that have been cleared for some years, the thawing process has been completed and the ground has stabilized. An important consideration in selecting a route was to utilize the existence of many rights of way such as seismic lines, winter roads and in particular the Canadian National Telegraph line that was built in the 1950s. From Fort Simpson north to Norman Wells, a large proportion of our route follows the Canadian National Telegraph line allowing us to minimize the environmental impact resulting from thawing of permafrost. Because of concerns about the impact of construction on traditional ways of life, the company appointed longtime northern trapper Art Look as wildlife advisor. As well as monitoring wildlife along the route, Art kept trappers informed of construction activity in their area and relayed their concerns to the company. Hello. Hi, Hello. John. Hello. Good seeing you again. Nice to see you. How are you today? Good, thanks. Interprovincial also appointed a full-time manager of Northern Relations to maintain close contact with concerned groups and individuals in the North. We've had a number of meetings with the community over the last several years concerning that water. Over the ensuing years, it's been my responsibility 
to meet on a regular basis with the federal project coordinator and with his territorial counterpart. Also, I have been involved on a regular basis in liaising with the territorial native organizations who have headquarters here in Yellowknife, the capital city, with the general public, with industry, and in fact with anyone who has an interest in what's going on with the project. Clearing of the right-of-way started a year before mainline construction began. The clearing contracts all went to businesses from small communities along the route. Over the course of the project, more than $60 million worth of contracts were awarded to northern firms. The logistics of moving supplies into this remote region made this project relatively expensive. Since there is no all-weather road access to most of the line, heavy materials and camp buildings had to be moved north by river barge and over winter roads. All mainline construction work was restricted to the first three months of 1984 and 85 when temperatures commonly dropped to 30 and 40 degrees below zero. At this time of year, the ground is frozen so hard that damage to the environment from the heavy equipment is minimized. The 12-inch diameter pipe was specially manufactured for this project. It was made of extra tough steel to counter the brittleness that results from extreme cold, and the walls of the pipe were extra thick for added strength. All the pipe has a corrosion-proof orange or yellow coating. Bending operation involves great precision. The pipe must be bent to follow exactly the contours of the land and negotiate each turn in the route. Pipeline welders are used to a fast-moving line and rigid scrutiny of their work even at the best of times. Each joint must be welded four times by four separate crews to ensure its permanence. On the Norman Wells pipeline, the welders also had to contend with short daylight hours and day after day of biting cold while working towards an urgent deadline.
In spite of the adverse conditions, the safety performance was good and very little time was lost because of the weather. Each weld was inspected visually, then tagged for permanent identification. Radiography was done with an X-ray unit activated by remote control to expose the film wrapped around each weld. Although thorough inspection procedures are mandatory in all pipeline work, the standards were especially high on this job. Each radiograph was carefully examined and even the most minute imperfections were repaired, then re-inspected. Early in winter, an insulating pile of snow, or berm, had been pushed up on top of the ditch line to slow down frost penetration. This was removed just before the ditcher came through. This heavy-duty ditcher was specifically designed for permafrost excavation. It weighs about a hundred tons and is driven by two powerful diesel engines. When things were going well, one ditcher could dig as much as three or four kilometers in a day. But it wasn't always that easy. In some swampy areas, frost penetration was minimal, so special treatment was required. Ditching was especially difficult in rocky areas. Since midwinter days in the north have only three or four hours of daylight, a good part of the work had to be done in the dark. The pipeline was buried for its entire length. Crude oil from the Norman Wells field flows easily, even at very low temperatures. Because oil moving through the finished pipeline is the same temperature as the ground, there is little danger of it melting the permafrost. Before the pipe was lowered into the ditch, an inspection crew used an electromagnetic instrument to check the pipe coating. Any nicks and scratches that might lead to corrosion were repaired. Extreme care was taken to protect the pipe. In some rocky areas, the pipe was covered with a protective foam before it was buried. 
In swampy areas, concrete saddle weights were used to hold the empty pipe down until it was filled with oil. All the concrete weights used on the pipeline were manufactured by northern businesses. Each phase of pipeline construction was thoroughly monitored to ensure that the high standards set for this project were consistently maintained. construction of the pipeline, Interprovincial welcomed many visitors who were interested in this unique project, including a group of northern school children. Now, probably a uh, pipeline and how it's built is something that's very new to you, so I'm going to try to very simply explain the stages in building a pipeline to you this morning. Then we're going to go out and look at what's happening out there for your own experience. Now, let's look at this page. And I will try to show you some of the equipment and some of the things that are done in building a pipeline. The visit of the Wrigley school children to see pipeline construction near their community was a typical example of IPL's community relations program. Wrigley is an important community to us. It's located very close to the right of way and we have a pump station not very far from the community as well. And it's important for us as the neighbors to all of the residents of Wrigley to make people feel comfortable with a pipeline located so close to their community. In planning and constructing the pipeline, we were very concerned about slope stability. The Norman Wells pipeline crosses approximately 300 slopes. Upon the investigation of those slopes, we determined that about 160 of them were sensitive for a couple of reasons. Either the fact that they were frozen or they were sensitive to erosion from spring runoff or rainfall. Of those slopes, we ended up doing detailed designs on approximately 67 of the slopes. In order to protect those that were sensitive to thawing, we investigated insulation available on the market and came to the conclusion that the use of wood chips was the most desirable solution to our problem. Wood chips were produced right on the pipeline, utilizing a renewable resource that was readily available. chips effectively prevent the sun's heat from penetrating the underlying permafrost. During the life of the pipeline, Interprovincial will continue to monitor the slopes to ensure that stability is maintained. Slope design also included the use of sandbags to prevent erosion. These diversion berms lead runoff water across and away from sensitive slopes. All the sandbag contracts went to groups from small communities like Fort Norman. Because of the scale of the operation, even tasks like filling the sandbags provided local families with a chance to earn some income.
Through meetings with local people before construction began, company representatives had learned that people from even the most traditional communities wanted work on the pipeline. Before starting construction, we developed a list of goods and services that we felt the northern people could be involved in the pipeline. This list consisted of items such as sandbag filling, skid making, concrete weights, security at the camps, etc. We felt that about $10 million could go into the communities. However, we were able to push $30 million worth of business contracts into these communities along the pipeline right away. The pipeline crosses over a hundred streams and rivers between Norman Wells and Zama. Most of the crossings were completed in winter as part of the normal mainline construction. The Mackenzie River crossing required special treatment. A trench for the pipe had to be blasted out of the bedrock under the river. This involved boring through two meters of ice to give the drillers access to the riverbed. In early June, the trench was cleared of rock in preparation for pulling the pipeline across the river. The Mackenzie is one of the great rivers of the world. At the Fort Simpson crossing, the river is one and a half kilometers wide. The pipeline had to be buried well beneath the riverbed to protect it from ice scour during spring breakup. The pipe was first covered with concrete and assembled into several sections on shore. The concrete protects the pipe and weighs it down. The pipe was pulled into the underwater trench and across the river with a steel cable attached to a winch on the opposite bank. As the end of each section was reached, the next section was attached. It took a full 12 hours to pull the pipe across the Mackenzie. Further north, the pipe was laid under the Great Bear River in the same way.
By midsummer, most traces of winter construction had disappeared along the right of way. To speed the restoration process, the completed sections of the pipeline were seeded with a mixture of specially selected grasses. During the summer, three pump stations were built to move the oil the 866 kilometers from Norman Wells to Zama. At each station, high pressure pumps are driven by diesel engines. A backup unit ensures 100% standby. The fully automated pump stations are designed to be remotely controlled from the Norman Wells Operation Center. Maintenance crews are stationed at both Norman Wells and Fort Simpson. The whole pipeline is monitored and controlled using a sophisticated microwave transmission system. If any problems arise, the pumps will shut down automatically and valves can be activated to close off a section of the line. The pump station at Norman Wells looks very much like others operated by Interprovincial across Canada. The difference is that this station is only 90 kilometers south of the Arctic Circle. On behalf of the government of the Northwest Territories and all Northerners, I am pleased and honored to be here today, participating in the opening ceremonies of the Norman Wells Oilfield Expansion and Pipeline Project. It's the first major hydrocarbon development in the north to reach production stage, and the first crude oil from the north to enter southern markets. Regarding business opportunities and employment, the pipeline project has surpassed all of its goals with $65 million in contracts awarded to northern firms and 1,500 northern residents employed directly and indirectly during construction of the pipeline in a variety of job skills. This project had to be carried out in a socially acceptable manner, an environmentally acceptable manner, and in an economic manner. And in all those three areas, we believe we have succeeded. That doesn't mean to say that we have not learned lessons for the future, and we believe in that area that this project serves as a pilot project for future endeavors.
All the sandbag contracts went to groups from small communities like Fort Norman. Because of the scale of the operation, even tasks like filling the sandbags provided local families with a chance to earn some income. Through meetings with local people before construction began, company representatives had learned that people from even the most traditional communities wanted work on the pipeline. Before starting construction, we developed a list of goods and services that we felt the northern people could be involved in the pipeline. This list consisted of items such as sandbag filling, skid making, concrete weights, security at the camps, etc. We felt that about $10 million could go into the communities. However, we were able to push $30 million worth of business contracts into these communities along the pipeline right away. The pipeline crosses over a hundred streams and rivers between Norman Wells and Zama. Most of the crossings were completed in winter as part of the normal mainline construction. The Mackenzie River crossing required special treatment. A trench for the pipe had to be blasted out of the bedrock under the river. This involved boring through two meters of ice to give the drillers access to the riverbed. In early June, the trench was cleared of rock in preparation for pulling the pipeline across the river. The Mackenzie is one of the great rivers of the world. At the Fort Simpson crossing, the river is one and a half kilometers wide. The pipeline had to be buried well beneath the riverbed to protect it from ice scour during spring breakup. The pipe was first covered with concrete and assembled into several sections on shore. The concrete protects the pipe and weighs it down. The pipe was pulled into the underwater trench and across the river with a steel cable attached to a winch on the opposite bank. As the end of each section was reached, the next section was attached. Mm -hmm. 
it took a full 12 hours to pull the pipe across the Mackenzie. Further north, the pipe was laid under the Great Bear River in the same way. By midsummer, most traces of winter construction had disappeared along the right of way. To speed the restoration process, the completed sections of the pipeline were seeded with a mixture of specially selected grasses. During the summer, three pump stations were built to move the oil the 866 kilometers from Norman Wells to Zama. At each station, high pressure pumps are driven by diesel engines. A backup unit ensures 100% standby. The fully automated pump stations are designed to be remotely controlled from the Norman Wells Operation Center. Maintenance crews are stationed at both Norman Wells and Fort Simpson. The whole pipeline is monitored and controlled using a sophisticated microwave transmission system. If any problems arise, the pumps will shut down automatically and valves can be activated to close off a section of the line. The pump station at Norman Wells looks very much like others operated by Interprovincial across Canada. The difference is that this station is only 90 kilometers south of the Arctic Circle. On behalf of the government of the Northwest Territories and all Northerners, I am pleased and honored to be here today, participating in the opening ceremonies of the Norman Wells Oilfield Expansion and Pipeline Project. It's the first major hydrocarbon development in the North to reach production stage, and the first crude oil from the North to enter Southern markets. Regarding business opportunities and employment, the pipeline project has surpassed all of its goals with $65 million in contracts awarded to northern firms and 1,500 northern residents employed directly and indirectly during construction of the pipeline in a variety of job skills. This project had to be carried out in a socially acceptable manner, an environmentally acceptable manner, and in an economic manner. And in all those three areas, we believe we have succeeded. That doesn't mean to say that we have not learned lessons for the future, and we believe in that area that this project serves as a pilot project for future endeavors.